are joining us for the first time or the first time in a while, we uh, started talking about what it looks like to live in the light last week. We we're in the book of 1 John for a couple weeks here leading up to Easter, and, um, and we, we looked last week at, at what it means to live in the light. And that's kind of a term or a metaphor I'm sure a lot of us are used to, right? That's something that the world, you know, go, don't go to the dark side, you know, uh, right? stay in the light side. Uh, it's a metaphor that gets happened in movies or gets talked about in movies a lot. But the, the, the thing about movies versus reality, I found it's easier to see who's on the dark side in the movies, right? You know why? They ugly. Like, look at, I mean, look at them dudes. They just, they ugly. <laughs> like, they wear black. They got jacked up faces. They, they ugly, right? But in real life, you know, you can look like that and be a pastor. So, you know, you got to, you got to figure out, you got to figure out what it means to actually live in the light. And, and so last week we talked about, okay, it's more than just talking about it. It's more than just dressing the part or something like that, that, that there are things that you need to do to show or that you can be able to see in other people who's living in the light. Um, and I think one of the the points that resonated the most with me has been rattling around in my soul, and, and maybe some of you uh, I know I talked to this past week, and, and it was this idea that the proof is in the practice, right? That you can say, oh, I'm in the light, I'm on the side of the light all you want, but the proof is in the practice. What, what do you make a practice of doing once you leave here today, right? Um, and, and so you should be able to tell who is on the side of the light by what they practice. They practice what they Preach, And that, by the way, gets further stated in John chapter 3. We didn't have time to get to these verses, but look at John, uh, 1 John 3, 7. It says, when people do what's right, it shows that they're righteous, even as Christ is righteous. But when people keep on sinning, it shows that they belong to the devil, who has been sinning since the beginning. But the Son of God came to destroy the works of the devil. Those who have been born into God's family do not make a practice of sinning. Now, remember that phrase from last week? We don't make a practice of sinning because God's life is in them. So they can keep on sinning, or so they can't keep on sinning because they are children of God. So now we can tell who are children of God and who are children of the devil. Anyone who does not live righteously and does not love other believers does not belong to God. And I know that offends our modern sensibilities. That sounds really judgy. Um, but we cannot get around the fact that normally, if it walks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, if it sins like a duck, what is it? It must be a duck, right? It is what it is. Um, but that last verse there is, uh, is the hinge that's going to swing us into what, from living in the light to loving in the light. It, it says, anyone who does not live righteously, that means, hey, stay away from sin, do what, what God calls you to do, and does not love other believers, does not belong to God. The truth is this, if you're taking notes, living in the light is about more than just not sinning, right? I know that sometimes we want to just simplify it down to, this is bad, stay away from bad, right? And we want to just, just don't, don't do those things, and just, I, I don't care if you do nothing, just don't sin. And that is not what the Christian life is about. That's not what your relationship with God is about. It's more than about just not sinning. And, and so you got to look the other side of the coin and figure out how God actually wants you to live and Love And so that's where we are. That's the mindset we need to take going into uh, 1 John 3. Let's keep reading in 1 John 3, now at verse 11. Now, I'm going to do this. I'm going to read you a little chunk, and then I want to stop and talk about it for, for a second here. Uh, and I want to build this foundation before we move on to John chapter 4. So, so just keep reading with me if you have your Bibles. It says, it says, this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. We must not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and killed his brother. Why did he kill him? Because Cain had been doing what was evil, and his brother had been doing what was righteous. So don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Now stop here for a second, because John gives us kind of the, the thesis statement, the big, the big point that he wants you to get, which is, we should love one another. Oh, you want to live in the light? Great. Love one another. And then he immediately shows us what not to do. He? he goes back to uh, an example that the people of that time would get and understand and know, Cain and Abel. Y'all ever read the story of Cain and Abel? Most of us can get that far in Genesis before we get distracted, so a lot of us know, <laughs> might not know what's in Exodus, but we know, uh, know the story of Cain and Abel, right? If you've not heard of it, that's okay. 
what happens was Cain decided to live in the darkness. Abel was living in the light, right? And so God blessed Abel for living in the light, and Cain got mad, and the rest is murder, right? He, he decided that, that that was what caused him to murder his brother. And so there was light, and there was darkness going on. And apparently those two things don't mix. And that's why John says, don't be surprised when it happens to you. He says, if you're going to live in the light, you're going to stick out because this world is full of darkness. And, and, and those two things do not mix. And so keep reading. Verse 14, he says, if we love our brothers and sisters who are believers, it proves that we have passed from death into life. By the way, that's what happens when you get saved. When you turn your life and your allegiance over to Jesus, you receive his forgiveness, you go from death to life. It says, but a person who has no love is still dead. Anyone who hates another brother or sister is really a murderer at heart. And you know that murderers don't have eternal life within them. Remember that whole pr proof is in the practice thing? Here it is again. It says, you want to tell me that you live in the light? Here's the proof. Do you love? Does love mark your life? And, you know, even there's other parts in the New Testament, other times where, where John and Jesus and the rest of the disciples make it very clear. We're to be known by our love. We're to be known by what we're for, not what we're against. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. My wife got me into this show this week called 1883. It's this, y'all know, y'all know about that? Yeah, got Sam Elliott in it, Coors Beer, you know that guy? And he, uh, <laughs> the, the, the ultimate cowboy, right? And so we, I got to watch in that show, and the one character that is Christian in there has to be top three, if not my least favorite person ever portrayed on screen. She's the worst. There's, there's no love anywhere to be seen around. She's negative. She's judgy. She's, she's being that, that kind of Christian that says, the Lord don't love ugly. You know, like that, that type of thing. Just kind of smacking around the main character. Just a generally wretched person. And, and before I even knew that, so my wife had watched a couple episodes already, and I was like, that, that lady spent about 30 seconds on the screen. I went, I hate that lady. She's <laughs> like, oh. Like, she's the worst. And, she, and Jenna looks at me and goes, by the way, that's the Christian. I'm like, oh, wonderful. What a wonderful example for the world to see. Now, I know that some, some Christians come by that, that uh, honest, but, you know, that, that some Christians have earned that. But that's what Hollywood tends to do is, is to find the worst examples and, and portray that. But I'm looking at her, I'm going, that's not a Christian because that lady had no hope. She had no joy. She had no peace. She had no love because you can tell me you're a Christian all you want, but you're, you're going to prove me, or you're going to prove yourself right or wrong depending on how you love. And, and so John here brings it back to this root issue. He goes kind of, he, he goes to this, he goes directly to murder. And you're like, whoa, Cain and Abel, murder? Wow, what? That, that escalated quickly. Why are you talking about murder? We're just talking about loving, right? But here's the thing. What was Cain's main issue? What was his root issue? That he was a murderer? No, he had no love. And that love, that lack of love for God, that lack of love for his brother, caused him to murder. But the heart issue was that he had no love. The action was just the evidence, right? But that sin came from within. And we have that same sin within us, too. So before you're thinking you're better than somebody... We've got to understand that, that we have the same root issue as Cain does when we do not love like God calls us to. But then John gets out of the, the bummer lane and goes back into something a little more encouraging. In verse 16, he says this. Keep reading. He says, we know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion... How can God's love be in that person? He's going, I'm looking at what you're doing here, and I'm going, ain't no way that the love of God is in you because of how you're acting. But, but we see that Jesus is the polar opposite of Cain, right? Jesus gives up his life that he didn't have to give up, while Cain took a life that wasn't his to take. Do you see the extreme opposites there going on? And John is saying, that's not what love is. This is what love is. Love is when you're willing to give up your life for someone else. That's what it means to be Christ-like and to love in the light. Keep reading. Verse 18 says this. Dear children, 
Let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show, let us show the truth by our actions. Our actions will show that we belong to the truth so that we will be confident when we stand before God. He said, we don't have to worry. If we love like God tells us to love, we can face God without any issue. And then verse 20 is big. It says, even if we feel guilty, God is greater than our feelings, and he knows everything. Let me say that again. God is greater than our feelings. Amen. Say that with me. God is greater than our feelings. Please believe that. Because what happens is if we don't feel loving, we're not going to be loving. Or when we feel like love maybe is something different than what God tells us to, we go with our feelings. John's like, you feel all you want. God is greater than our feelings. Aren't you glad, though? Aren't you thankful for that? And so to recap here, this is the foundation I want us to build on today. Our actions, whether they're full of love or they're full of hate, are evidence of who we are and who we belong to. All right? But let's turn over now to John chapter 4 real quick because here's why I want to make some important points to you about what it means to love in the light. And we're just going to read this whole, it's about 12 verses. I know most of us have the attention span of a goldfish, but hang with me here. It's a lot. 1 John 4, starting with verse 7, it says, Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love God, or does not know God, or does not love, does not know God. Easy for me to say. For God is love. Verse 9 says, God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Verse 11 says, Dear friends, since God loves us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God has God living in them, and they live in God. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. Verse 17 says, God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. You're like, wow, that's a lot of repetitiveness. Apparently, we need to hear it a couple times for it to sink in. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. We can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he first loved us. Amen? Amen. So three main points I want to make about this. I know that was a lot. Right? And I encourage you to go back and read that, really soak on that. Because you could read that passage for, for a week or two and get something new out of it and it rock your socks. But let me, give you, let me give you a couple things I want you to take home with you. Number one, loving in the light starts with and stays in God. If you want to love in the light, you've got, it, it, it begins with God and it does not part from God. I've argued with many atheist and agnostic friends of mine over the years, especially in college. That's what kind of happens on college campuses. Um, and they, they, they say things like, I don't need God to love. I don't need God to know what is good. That may work for you, but I don't, I don't need that. I wish I knew John 5 a little better, or John, 1 John 3 a little better back then. But, but I, sorry, but you do, Right? Even if you say, oh, I don't need God to love, guess what? The only reason you know anywhere close to what love is is because God first loved us and somebody modeled that for you. Even though you don't give him credit for it, how your mama loves you, how your daddy loves you, how, how your spouse loves you, that first was given to us. We don't come up with this on our own, right? It was given to us. It was displayed for us. It was lavished upon us first and foremost by God. He is the source. Verse 7 said what? Love comes from God. Verse 10 says, this is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. By the way, love is not how you love God, because we screw that up too. Love is because we de define love how God loves us. And, and uh, Romans 5 reminds us, even while we were his enemy, Paul says, even while we were 
on the other team, even though we were sinners, while we were still sinners, God loved us, so he started it, really. And he's, by the way, better believe if he started it, he will finish it in glory one day. And so knowing the source is really important. Because if you know the source of love, you won't stray too far from that. Right? If you want to love your spouse well, if you want to love your kids well, if you want to love your family well, if you want to love your neighborhood well, you better not get too far from God. Because what does it say? The more you're in him, the more perfect your love becomes. And so we, you're going, oh, this is not working out. I, I, I can't figure out how to get along with my spouse. I can't figure out why do my kids hate me. Well, it might be because you've strayed from the love that God showed you. And maybe you need to get a little bit closer to God and, and let him love you the way that love is supposed to be. But here's the tough part. Yeah, it starts with him. Yes, the closer we are to God, the better we love people. But if it starts with God, it's got to stay there. We don't get to remix it. We don't get to make it in our own image. It's love stays within his boundaries and his design, right? This is the tension that happens when you put, for instance, biblical love against uh, some of the movements of this age. Of, like, for instance, the LGBTQ thing, that their thing is love is love. By the way, I love that phrase. Yeah, love is love. But wait a minute. What do you mean by that? Right? Because that sounds real good. How can you not say love is love? But the thing is, God gets to define love, not us. So love is love. But it's like Princess Bride. I don't think that means what you think it means. Right? <laughs> yeah, you say love, but I don't think that's what that is. By the way, it's not just that hot button issue. There are apparently pastors going around this town saying, you know, I know you're not married, but y'all can have sex as long as it's Done in love. Whew. Usa, usa. Okay. Listen, that's impossible. That's impossible. Why? Because when you walk away from God, you walk away from love. Right? And the farther you get from God, the less it's like love. It may be affection, maybe attraction. It may be all you may be feeling things, but what what did we just find out? God is bigger than our feelings. God is greater than our feelings. And so it's impossible to do something in love when it is not in Christ, when it is not in God. Loving in the light means we don't get to define love. We leave it to the one who is love. So loving in the light starts with and stays in God. Let me move on before I get canceled. Okay. <laughs> Number two, loving in the light also involves selfless sacrifice. That's what verse 9 and 10 laid out for us. God showed how much he loves us by sending us a nice card, by uh, tolerating all, the, all of our lifestyle choices, by supporting us no matter what. Nope, by sending his one and only son. This is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and did what? Sent his son as a sacrifice. That's, John's being very clear. This is how you love someone. You sacrifice for them. You give up for them. Jesus said, Himself in John 15, 13, he says, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You know, I've, I've gotten in debates with people before, but why did Jesus have to die? I'm talking about Easter. Why did Jesus have to go on the cross? Was, was it just because God was, liked blood? Was God some weird sadistic father? Or why did Jesus have to die? Especially when, you, like, it was God. If he's really God, he knew he was going to come back. Why did he have to die that's just like a cheat code. Why this doesn't make sense? But you realize that giving up your life for someone, there's no greater way to show that you love. And God had to figure out a way to show us how much he loves us. And, and so along with it being, you know, justice and, you know, sin has to be paid for. Also, there's no greater way for God to show his love for us than to let his son die. Because that's what you do. You give life instead of take it. That's what love is. I, I keep seeing these, these pages on social media. They, they, bless their hearts, they're trying to be deep and they're trying to be profound, but they've got the world's wisdom, so it just sounds dumb, right? There'll be these pages that, that get shared where they'll say, you gotta stop doing for people that won't do for you. I saw that one this week. Like, I'm done doing for people that won't do for me. I'm like, isn't that exactly what Jesus does? Isn't that the exact opposite attitude I'm supposed to have? I heard a, when I was engaged, there was an old codger up at the gas station in Bear Creek 
But, you know, there was this table of wisdom that was sitting there. And, you know, those of y'all from Harper's Crossroads know they, they run the world back there, man. And, and, and one, of them I was, one, one of them I was telling that, uh, I don't remember who it was, to be honest, because God didn't know me from Adam, but I was telling one of them that I, I'm engaged. I'm getting married soon. And this guy goes, you know, marriage is just legalized prostitution. That's all that is. I went, well, thanks for your encouragement. All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Really excited about that, right? I'm like, what a jacked up way to think about marriage. But then I was like, wait a minute. If you do it how the world does it, that's kind of what it is. When you love the way that most of our relationships, if they're not in God, most of our relationships, whether it be marriage, dating, friendships, it's, it's a glorified business contract. You do for me, and I'll do for you. Quid pro quo, right? Tip for tap. Uh, but as soon as you stop doing for me, I'm going to stop doing for you. That's a contract. That's a business contract. That's not love, right? That's, but that's how most marriages are. You stop making me happy, I'm out of here. I talked to a friend of mine, dear friend, doesn't go to this church, but a friend of mine I caught up with, and, and he, he was in what he thought was a Christian marriage. Had a wonderful job, beautiful kids, beautiful house. Been married about 10, 12 years, and... Recently, his wife says, you know, I'm just not happy anymore. I want a divorce. You just don't make me happy like you used to. He was shell-shocked. He's like, wait a minute. There's some days I'm not happy either. I don't mean I leave. But that when you don't have God's perspective on love, that's what love is. You stop doing for me, I'm out of here. That's not how God loves us. Aren't you glad that God shows us a better way to love? When you... That's, that's what happens when you define love as what you get. When love is sacrificing for someone that you love. Loving in the light means without hesitation, you do what's best for that person that you love. Even if that means you miss out on something. I caught up with some friends lately who are just now getting married, which I can't even fathom, right? Because so, right, I'm a marriage and five kids deep, and I'm like, I live a very different life than you, buddy. <laughs> But I, I, he was telling me about all these cool things he was doing, and how he travels, and he's got all this stuff. I'm like, man, that's really cool. I wish, I wish I could do that. And then God's like, do you? Right? I was like, you know what? No. Because the only way I could do that is to not have my wife and kids. And I love them. And I'm okay giving up for them. I could try to chase after travel and all this cool stuff and all these cool hobbies that my buddy was doing. I got to give that up some but I'll do it for the people that I love. I'll do it because it's worth it. Because that's what love is. So don't tell somebody you love them unless you're willing to give something up for them. That's the type of love that God shows us. There's one more thing I want you to get before we get out of here. Number three, loving in the light runs on courage, not fear. When you love in the light, when you love the way God loves, then what you've got is courage, not fear. I can't tell you how many times a parent or a spouse has come and says, they've got this nagging worry that keeps them up at night. They're like, I'm just afraid that so-and-so is going to do this. I'm afraid they're going to ruin their life. And so, you know what, as long as I know I don't, I don't agree with everything they're doing, but if, if they'll just do that close to me, it'll be okay. And what ends up happening is if you take that fearful notion and you feed it, instead of repenting of it and giving it to God. Because, by the way, it's natural when danger happens, when things happen, for you to, to be concerned about the people you love. But when you let that turn into fear, what happens is you compromise on what is right. And at the moment that you start acting in fear, you stop loving them. Amen, right? <laughs> the moment that you say, I'm going to stop doing what's good for you, and start doing what's good for me, right? Because that's what it is. And so much of that is us trying to uh, really love ourselves. When you say, well, I just don't want to lose that person. That's part, yeah, you see, you hear the selfishness in that? I would confront them about their sin. I would try to change their mind, but I don't want them to get mad at me. I don't want them to hate me. I don't want them to leave. All right, well, then you're just making a decision. You're not going to do what's best for them so that you get what you want. That's what verse 18 said. Such love has no fear. Because what? Perfect love expels all fear. For afraid, it's for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced 
his perfect love. The more you are, are, are fearful for them, it's because you want them. It's because you, you don't want to lose them. But is that really the best thing for them sometimes? If you're not willing to give up for them or give up them? I've had to give tough love to friends, to family, knowing full well that they may never get over it and they may always hate me. But it's worth it if there is a, a smidge of a chance that they could get right and they could start doing things that are better for their life and they can start living in the light instead of living in darkness. It takes a little risk to, to pull someone out of the darkness and back into the light. But when you love someone with God's perfect love, you're going to do what's best for them, even if that means they leave you. Even if that means that, because you're not thinking about you. You're thinking about them. What do I need to do for them to have the best possible outcome here? And by the way, the best possible outcome is for them to do what's right with God. Loving in the light is going to send you into a burning building in front of a bullet. Whatever it takes to stop thinking about you and start thinking about them. And I know that doesn't sound very fun, but look at verse 17. It gives us some encouragement. 1 John 4, 17 says, So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him, talking about God, with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. The more you love like God, the more of his courage you have. It does take courage to confront. It does take courage to stay in the light because darkness is easier sometimes. And it does take courage to defeat fear. We don't have to cower in the corner when we live like Jesus, right? You, you ever walked in on your kid when they're doing something they're not supposed to? <laughs> right? Like, uh-oh, they just see it on their face. It's over, right? I really feel like some of us, when we get to God, we're going to go, uh-oh, uh-oh, he's here. He's here. What do we do, guys? Like, oh, 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 I remember all the junk I did. All that week before I died was a mess. And that's fresh. God's going to be like looking at the tape going, mm-hmm. We don't have to do like, we don't have to confront God like that. We don't have to be fearful of that. When we live like Jesus and we love like Jesus, we get to go into the presence of God face up, eyes out, eyes on him, arms out. Hey, you don't have to be afraid of being in the presence of God. By the way, I know plenty of people over the years who won't even, they, they'll have a bad week, they'll sin really bad, they'll go back into an old habit, and they go, I can't show my face at church. Oh, better not go to church. Why? Because God's going to be mad at me. But when we live and love like God calls us to, we don't have to worry about that. And, but when we're afraid, it shows that we're not experiencing God's perfect love that casts out all fear. As soon as you're afraid, you're not being loving anymore. So my question is, have you ever experienced the perfect love of God? Because if you start to experience that, whether you experience it in a, in a saving way where he finally forgives your sins and you finally turn yourself over to him or the perfect love that will sustain you for the rest of your life. The more you do that, the more you live in the light, the more perfect love of God will mark your existence.